<laughs> What's so funny? I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 facts about the Princess Bride that will ruin your childhood. Don't even think about <coughs> yeah. I would not say such things if I were you. If, you know, it was on a list of the, you know, one of the great screenplays that would never have never been made. For this list, we're looking at behind the scenes secrets that may change how you see your favorite childhood movie. For this, we apologize in advance. Which entry surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. The time period is hard to pin down. Since its release, fans have been trying to figure out when this mystical story took place. But to date, no one has. So let's look at the clues. When Buttercup says, With eyes like the sea after a storm, she could be referring to Francis Danby's famous painting from 1824, Sunset at Sea After a Storm. Vizzini mentions that Australia was, quote, entirely peopled with criminals, and the first fleet didn't arrive until 1788. So that supports the idea that we're sometime in the 19th century. And criminals are used to having people not trust them as you are not trusted by me, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you. Truly, you have a dizzying intellect. But then, if you consider the fashion, the weapons, and the Renaissance decor, you're looking at mid-1500s. So, inconclusive. And you cannot track that. Not with a thousand bloodhounds. And you cannot break it. Not with a thousand swords. Really, though, it doesn't matter. The mystery just adds to the magic of it. Number 9. The machine was a recycled prop. We hate to break it to you, but this age-stealing, pain-inducing contraption wasn't built with 1987's Princess Bride in mind. Beautiful, isn't it? Took me half a lifetime to invent it. I'm sure you've discovered my deep and abiding interest in pain. It was actually constructed in 1983 for a totally different movie. I do owe you an explanation. My name is Bond, James Bond. That's right, the archaic torture machine was originally intended for Never Say Never Again. It was designed by art director Richard Holland and originally featured bones along the sides and was powered by sand weights. And these sand weights would eventually fill up and fall on this giant spike that would, as Bond was strapped on this wheel, be spinning around and this hitting him as he reached a certain point. Ultimately, Bond changed aesthetics, and the giant wheel was snatched up for director Rob Reiner, while Holland made some minor changes, like replacing the sand with water. Either way, it's a clever invention, and we're glad it ended up in our favorite childhood movie. As you know, the concept of the suction pump is centuries old. Really, that's all this is, except that instead of sucking water, I'm sucking life. Number 8. Iocane powder isn't real. I smell nothing. What you do not smell is called Iocane powder. It is odorless, tasteless, dissolves instantly in liquid, and is among the more deadly poisons known to man. Sounds legit, right? Referred to as one of the deadliest poisons on the planet, this toxic powder is untraceable. Fortunately, one can build an immunity to it by increasing the amount ingested over a period of time. <laughs> What's so funny? I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. However, even though this sounds fairly plausible, it's total fiction. Iocane powder does not exist. Never has, never will. Of course, it doesn't really matter. It just adds to the timelessness of the movie. As Carrie Elwes, who played Wesley, said in his book, As You Wish, quote, like a good wine without Iocane powder, it seems to get better with age. Iocane. I bet my life on it. Number seven. The movie wasn't that popular at first. These days, everyone loves a good spoof film. I believe you. After The Princess Bride, Mr. Elwes would go on to star in Mel Brooks's Robin Hood Men in Tights. Harry, Harry, thrust, thrust, go. But although spoof movies became all the rage in the 90s, they were fairly uncommon in 1987, which made them difficult to market. Even worse, The Princess Bride shared the same opening weekend as the blockbuster hit Fatal Attraction. Does that make you feel good? Does it make me feel bad? Even though it received two thumbs up from Siskel and Ebert, it was slow to take off. To say the least, the $200,000 it generated that weekend was abysmal compared to their original $16 million budget. I would not say such things if I were you! Luckily, viewership picked up, and once released on home video, it became a favorite, spanning generations. Number 6. Mel Smith could never bear to watch the movie. Mel Smith, who played the keeper of the pit of despair, was so uncomfortable during filming that he's never even watched the movie himself just to avoid reliving that painful period in his life. Where's the man in black? 
the albino character called for specific eye color, and in order to achieve this, Smith had to wear contacts. Unfortunately, neither he nor the rest of the cast and crew had any idea that he was severely allergic to the contact solution they used. Don't even think <coughs> Don't even think about trying to escape. Even still, the actor powered through his scenes and was still able to expertly produce the disturbing but slightly adorable albino we all know and, well, kind of love. Number 5. The film was almost never made. Can you imagine a world where the Princess Bride doesn't exist? That would be inconceivable. Well, it almost happened. It wasn't just that the movie made peanuts on opening weekend. The screenplay was bounced around so many times that writer William Goldman had lost almost all hope. Initially, 20th Century Fox bought the rights, but due to unforeseen circumstances, the script lay untouched. A technicality that will shortly be remedied. That is, until Reiner arrived on the scene. While brainstorming his next project in 1986, he remembered a book he'd read almost a decade earlier and knew he wanted to make into a movie. I was so naive. I didn't know that, you know, they had tried to make them, you know, Francois Truffaut was involved, Redford was involved, Norman Jewison, fifth, you know, it was on a list of the, you know, one of the great screenplays that would never, had never been made. Mind you, it wasn't smooth sailing from there either, but Reiner was determined to get it made. And thank goodness for that. Number 4. Arnold Schwarzenegger Almost Played Fezzik From the beginning, writer William Goldman had known that the 7'4 wrestler Andrei Ruzumov, also known as Andrei the Giant, would be the perfect Fezzik. Pardon me, Simporto. Fezzik, please. Thank you. Unfortunately, Andrei was at the peak of his wrestling career and couldn't do it. Goldman's next choice was an up-and-coming Austrian bodybuilder, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Development stalled, however, and by the time Reiner picked up the project years later, the Predator star was unavailable. Get Ramirez on his feet, get to the chopper! Initially, Andre seemed to be too busy as well, but as fate would have it, he had to cancel his prior commitment, freeing him up to play Fezzik. That's wonderful. Number 3. Andre the Giant was in pain and needed a stunt double. You know those scenes where Fezzik is being all gianty? Are you just fiddling around with me or what? I just want you to feel you're doing well. Well, a lot of the time it's actually a stunt double. Andre the Giant had serious back problems due to acromegaly, a disorder that causes gigantism. He'd actually recently had surgery and drank a lot to numb the pain. I do not envy you the headache you will have when you're awake. This also meant he had to be really careful on set. Having their Fezzik was all that mattered, so Reiner went back to the drawing board. The epic piggyback fight? A stunt double from afar, with Wesley standing on ramps for close-ups. Haven't fought just one person for so long. In that moment when Fezzik catches Buttercup, she was on cables, and he was standing against a board for support. Number two, there was originally a different ending. Grandpa, maybe you could come over and read it again to me tomorrow. As you wish. As it turns out, the famous last line, as you wish, was not the original ending. The movie was supposed to end with the grandson seeing the four heroes outside his window. Because we have, you know, Peter Falk saying, as you wish. We had the little boy, after Peter Falk leaves, he leafs through the book and he starts, you know, reliving it. And then we had the four heroes on the four white horses. He looks out the window and he sees them and he waves to them. So why did he change it? Well, the original ending would have been pretty epic with its quartet of misfits on white horses, but the legendary director wanted to send a different message, making the movie more about the bond between the grandson and grandfather created through the magic of storytelling. Still, we have to admit it makes us sad knowing there's a deleted scene we'll probably never see. Someday you may not mind so much. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. There were a lot of injuries. Get some rest. If you haven't got your health, you haven't got anything. There were more than a few injuries on set during filming, and for the silliest possible reasons. Kerry Elwes broke his toe while goofing around on Andre's ATV. Afraid of getting fired, Elwes tried and failed to hide it. You mock my pain! Life is pain, Highness. 
Anyone who says differently is selling something. Mandy Patinkin actually bruised a rib from the strain of holding in his laughter over Billy Crystal's improv. <laughs> I did a lick all day, Nisha. That is a noble cause. Elvis was heard again after asking Christopher Guest to actually hit him, which Guest did, giving Elvis a concussion. Guest received his own injury when Patinkin accidentally stabbed him in the thigh during their duel. Guest was reportedly convinced that Patinkin was lost in character and threw out the choreography, just trying to survive. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Stop saying that! It's a good thing Reiner didn't believe in bad omens. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.